This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 127, recorded April 1st, 2011. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV your podcast all about viruses. And even though it's April Fool's Day, we're not going to make any jokes. So everything we're going to say from now on is true. (laughs) Well, true in the sense of, you know what I mean. Yeah. It may not be right, but it's true. (laughs) I'm not going to play any jokes. Hey, so there you go. There's Rich Condit from North Central Florida. How you doing, Rich? Oh, I got top billing today. Yeah, why not? That's great. <laughs> I'm uh, sorry. I, I didn't I'm, mean to keep you third all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. You know, it's okay. Where the, where's Dixon? He's having a meeting next door with people from Newark, New Jersey, about vertical farms. And that's more important than oh, Twib? Yeah. Well, he'll, he'll come in halfway through, probably. All right. Bunch of suits. Yeah. I, uh, boy, leave me out of that. Yeah. I have no desire to be in that meeting. No. Is Dixon wearing a tie? No, he's not. Good. He's not at all. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts is Alan Dove. Good to be here. How you doing, Alan? Doing okay. Very happy that most of the snowstorm missed us. Is Was there a snowstorm? It uh, hit Connecticut pretty thoroughly, I think. Mm. Yeah, we, had we few, just got a dusting. A few flurries here. Yes, I'm happy to. We've had enough snow. Yes. Winter is over. And today it is April Fool's Day, but uh, we will do serious virology. We have three stories we'd like to get to, so let's get to it. The first one was suggested, no, it was a pick by someone, maybe that was Dixon a few weeks ago, a novel bunya virus isolated in China. And this is some paper. Yeah, this is really cool. Yeah, well, I, really I mean, like it. It, you know, cool in the sense of very interesting. It's its title is "Fever with Thrombocytopenia Associated with a Novel Bunya Virus in China." There are many authors, mm. and it's in the New England Journal of Medicine. And I want to point out that it was fun, the work was funded by the China Mega Project for Infectious Diseases, and this is quite a mega project. Mm-hmm. Well, so, large number of collaborators and a big project. I mean, uh, this is this is so not like the Chinese. <laughs> yes, right. And I note that one of the uh, authors is already deceased. So this was such a huge uh, authorship here that just by chance someone died during the preparation of the work. That's how big wow. it is. So this started in 2009, apparently. There was a new disease noted in rural areas of central China, severe fever with thrombocytopenia. Shortage of platelets. Right. And not all, good. Not good. You need those platelets. Also gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, otherwise, what are you going to serve the foodlets on? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no, seriously, you need them for clotting. And then we have leukocytopenia, which is decrease in white blood cells. And right. We, and we need those to fight infections, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. So they they said let's figure out what this is and they ruled with a out case, a case fatality rate oh, of yes. 30 percent. Thank you. Which That's is, huge. Which is high. So they went through some bacteria, anaplasma, which they ruled out. And anaplasma, I must admit, I have not heard of previously. Have you, Alan? No, I had not. And uh, they decided it was not bacterial. And you didn't then, ask me. Uh, Rich, do you know what anaplasma is? Nope. <laughs> All right. I figured you didn't. Like, you're as narrow as I am, but I right. could be wrong. Uh, so. No, nope, I didn't know. I looked it up. You know. Yeah, it's a bacterium that can right. cause these symptoms. So they started doing some workups, and what they did was uh, put samples from the patients into cell cultures. They took... Um, they took white, white cells from patients and stuck them into cultures. White, right. white cells. Yes, that's right. They took white cells, and they inoculated monolayers. And this is, I found this very interesting. The one that they, uh, they actually got first was from a 42-year-old man, the first virus. They inoculated monolayers. Actually, it's a dog microphage line that they initially right. used. And I think it took a month 
mm-hmm. before they saw changes in the cell monolayers, cytopathic effects. And then they took that and then reinfected cells, and then it happened quicker. So I guess the issue was that there wasn't much virus there to begin with, I suppose. That would be that would be my suspicion. Of course, you could always, in passaging it, you could always, the virus could acquire changes that it would adapt it to cell culture. Right. That's not uncommon either. But uh, my guess is that at least in the beginning, they were dealing with very little virus. Yeah, I was thinking probably very little virus and probably not a cell line that's ideally... Yeah. adapted to to replicate it so the two things together you might ask why they used a canine macrophage line well, they tried a bunch of different lines and this is the one that gave them cytopathic effects yeah it actually grows on a bunch of different yeah. cells it's in the end they find out but the only one where they could easily see it was this because it causes morphological changes in the cells i found this approach interesting because it may not be the one that you would use here in the U.S., I, I suspect you would use maybe this in conjunction with PCR, but here we're using classical virology. Absolutely. You know, and yeah. It just goes to show if you don't have visible effects of a virus in a cell, it's hard to detect it. Right. Now, in my lab, uh, nothing would last a month in the incubator, so we couldn't do these <laughs> isolations. We'd let it go a week, and if nothing happened, we'd throw it away and go on to something else. Uh, to, to the cytopathic effect to me is interesting too, and they have a really nice uh, picture here. I'm used to, I'm used to using cells that grow pretty flat in a monolayer, and cytopathic effect is typically is the cells rounding up. This is the opposite. The canine monocytes are ordinarily kind of round, and when they show the cytopathic effect, they flatten out on the dish, become more macrophage-like. Right. Cool picture. So after this first one, they got seven more strains by inoculating cell cultures and then of course they went on to sequence these and they turned out to be bunya viruses are you guys still there yeah oh, you just got so quiet yeah <laughs> no we're letting you walk through it well they also did um electron microscopy yes of the infected cells and they saw virus particles there yeah which are obviously membrane so that's a clue. The electron micrographs uh, make it obviously a membraned virus. That's correct. So that doesn't narrow it much, but some. And you could tell the size also, which will narrow it further. Mm-hmm. But of course, to identify it, you'd need to do some sequencing, right? Right. Which is what they did, and it turns out to be a bunya virus. Now, does anyone know an example of a bunya virus? Too bad our audience can't chime in here. <laughs> uh, Rift Valley Fever. Yeah, we've talked about that on TWIV, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Hantavirus. Hanta, right. Segmented, uh, negative, stranded uh, RNA enveloped. viruses. Enveloped. Yep. Enveloped, right? Some, enveloped. Sometimes, sometimes they're vector-borne, like ticks, right? And, and something we haven't talked about a lot is that uh, not only is it segmented, but in some of the bunya viruses, one of the segments is ambisense. That's right. has both polarities, right? Right. Mm. Both a plus and a minus, two different genes, one in the plus open reading frame, one in the minus open reading frame. Yeah, which is, I've always found that odd, why they would evolve to be that way. Yeah. And just these viruses and no others, right? Uh, actually, the arena viruses do mm-hmm. this some. Yeah. I think it's arena viruses, but there's just a couple of them. Well, it's a way to save genome space if that's a yeah. if that's the pressure. I suppose, but, you know, you don't find it everywhere, so it's not... No, right, it's not universal. Not universal. So that uh, showed it was a bunya, but it was a novel bunya, so it's, in fact, in fact the bunyas... If, there's a great bunya virus page on Viral Zone. I love this website. A wonderful yeah, website. I use it all the time. And you can see the classification of um, the bunya viruses, and, of course, like any good viral family, it's divided into genera. And um, this one is part of the Flebo virus genus. It's a new member of the Flebo. Flebo or Flebo, I'm not sure. I, I don't know how to pronounce that. Because there's hantaviruses, nirovirus, orthobunya, Flebo, and Tospo, which I believe are viruses that infect plants. That's right. Tomato spotted wilt virus is the type species. And it's vectored by an insect, right? Mm-hmm. And the Flebos are also vectored. Here it says mosquitoes. Oh, here's another one we've talked about before, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus. Right. Yep. So a lot of these are pretty nasty viruses. Right. 
uh, and but often associated with hemor- hemorrhagic fever of some sort. They also looked at serology in these patients. They had sera before. They have acute and convalescent sera. So what that means is when you're really sick, they get sera, which is probably when you first come to the physician. And then when you're better, they take sera. And then they look at the rise in antibodies. Antibodies don't typically rise until late in infection. So you can see an increase from acute to convalescent sera. And in fact, they demonstrated in fact, specific viral antibodies. They did actually neutralization tests in cell culture to show that the antibodies in these patients were against the specific virus that they had isolated from uh, those 11 or 12 individuals. Right. And you know, there, was, there are some important points that came up both in the sequencing and the, the antibodies. Um, <clears throat> all the patients who were PCR positive for the virus were antibody positive. Right. And and it wasn't a vague antibody positivity where you had to kind of look at it sideways. It was very, very clearly, you know, these people are generating antibodies against this virus. Um, 100% of the ones who they checked in this initial, you know, PCR positive set. Yeah. And and the sequences show pretty much what you'd expect for a novel bunyavirus. There, there's a, you know, some diversity there. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it looks like what ought to be coming out of this population. I think there's also evidence from the sequence that there's no human-to-human transmission, right? Right. Right. And probably all independent infections from whatever the source was. Right. They're not related closely enough to have been human-to-human. And when they get to the, I mean, uh, also uh, uh, in the serology, they did epidemiology. So they they looked at a bunch of uh, normal controls, and none of them had antibodies. So... Uh, importantly from that, it's not like you get a lot of inapparent of infections. It looks like if you get infected, you get sick. Right. right. And you right. don't There's nobody, they, they looked at a, at a couple hundred people in the endemic area who were matched to cases, and, and then they looked at a bunch of people outside the endemic area, too, um, who were healthy or who had other conditions, and they find this, uh, they find this virus nowhere except in cases of this disease. So, no human-to-human transmission. Uh, uh, you, if you get infected, you get sick, so there are very few uh, inapparent infections. They don't really know what the natural host was. They suspect, I suppose, because of the family, that it might be insect-borne. Uh, it's l- like a classic zoonosis. There's some host out here, out there, that has this thing, and occasionally it gets into humans and causes a big problem, kind of like hantavirus. Right, and tellingly, 97% of the um, of the patients they looked at in, in the initial cohort um, turned out to be farmers who lived in in you know wooded areas. Mm-hmm. Yep. So yep. very consistent with the zoonosis. So they have a little description here of the symptoms, which they say are nonspecific, which means any virus could cause them. Right. And they have a uh, member of 30% fatality. They say multi-organ f- failure developed, but they don't know why the deaths occurred. What I find really cool is the epidemiology. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they went and looked at, so as, as uh, Alan said, a lot of them were farmers li- living in rural areas. So they started looking in... Um, Mosquitoes. They they checked five thousand nine hundred mosquitoes. Yeah. Wow. Well, we got a lot of authors. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's <laughs> probably only about ten mosquitoes each. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and they're all negative for viral RNA by PCR. Can you imagine doing five thousand nine hundred? Yeah. And then, really? so I can imagine you you get a hundred and they're negative, and the boss says, "Go get a hundred more," and they're yeah. negative, and they say, "Well, keep getting more." <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, mosquitoes are easy to get, too. But then they looked at ticks, and uh, 10 out of 186 ticks were, were positive for the same virus, pretty much. And uh, there you go. It might be in ticks. So only 5.4%, but I guess you just need a positive tick to get you. Uh, it wasn't exactly the same virus. Yeah, not exactly, right? but similar enough so that they called it the same virus, which uh-huh. is SFTSV. Yeah. Now, shouldn't this be something like uh, Henan virus or? Um, yeah. Yeah, they need to get a better name. SFTSV. But I guess we're probably stuck with it at this point. And SFTSV is based on the um, severe fever with 
thrombocytopenias. Yeah, that's sort of like uh, SARS, right? Well, I guess SARS mm-hmm. stuck. Severe acute yeah. respiratory yeah. syndrome. Yeah, but SARS is pronounceable. Yeah, this one is not. It's all consonants, right? That, now, this has been a really nice exercise so far, and I think this is really instructive for us with respect to other viruses, which we've talked about. They say in the discussion, first sentence was, although we have not fulfilled Koch's postulates, um, our findings suggest that SFTS is caused by a newly identified Bunya virus. Right. So, and, if, and in fact, we would all agree that the data don't prove anything, right? Right. right. Well, they do. Right. They they prove a lot of interesting things about this new virus they've discovered, but they don't prove that it causes this disease. Right. It's just in a lot of people that have the disease, but they'll have to do some studies elsewhere in China and the rest of the world to see if the association stands. Looks pretty good to me. It um, does. No. It and, looks good. And the, the things that I pointed out are the, the things that really stood out to me, you know, in contrast with some studies that you see where, eh, it could be this, could be that. Um... You know, yeah, this could be um, this could be a, a secondary infection. It's just an opportunist. But then, if you look in patients who have other conditions, maybe you ought to see it. And you could say maybe you haven't looked at a big enough sample. But it's kind of suspicious that in people who don't have this condition, do they haven't yet found this virus? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I have and, a, what, my question is: Why are they just finding this? Is this a new disease, or it's just never been? I think it's a matter of looking. They say they don't think it's a new disease. Right. Okay? They say that it's probably it's probably been around for a while. Now, actually, if that's true, you would think that if you did a wider sero survey, well, maybe you wouldn't because it's pretty lethal. Maybe you and it depends on it depends on how antibody. persistent the antibodies are. They right. do note that. Um, uh, somewhere in here, they said uh, people up to a year after infection seem to still be antibody positive, um, which does suggest that if you did if you did um, maybe a broad serial survey in these rural areas, especially, um, it ought to turn up. Yeah, yeah. And this once again reminds me of hantavirus because there's um, uh, there's a long history of. People dying of acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, in the U.S. of uh, you know unknown etiology. And right. When the when hantavirus was identified as something that could jump from mice into people and cause these same symptoms, my understanding is that they went back and looked at sera from a lot of these uh, cases of basically idiopathic ARDS. And found that yes, indeed, those people had in, been infected with a hantavirus as well. So, as they say, the symptoms are nonspecific, and my guess is that that people come in with these sorts of symptoms really sick and uh, and die all the time, and you just don't know what it is until you have the right tools to uh, and the motivation to look for it. Right, and in fact, the way they defined the cases here, um, it's it's really kind of a broad net. You know, you've got a severe acute fever and thrombocytopenia. And then you've eliminated all of the known causes. And that's the standard for the case definition, which is probably why when they do their epidemiologic sur- survey, um, they see something like 70% of the uh, SFTS cases were positive for this virus. And presumably the other 30% could have some other unknown thing. Sure. Yeah, because these are nonspecific symptoms. Right. Could be a lot of things. So what would what's to be done next? Don't get well, bitten by ticks in China. <laughs> well, first of all, they've got uh importantly, this work will give them out of this will come a test so that uh they can in the future uh look at people who come in with uh, these sorts of symptoms and include uh, an appropriate ELISA or something like that or maybe a PCR test in their uh, ultimate diagnosis to see if they have this. That doesn't get you very far because you can't really treat it. Right. right. So then if you decided it was serious enough, I guess the next thing is to uh, uh, go looking for a vaccine. Yeah, it depends on how extensive it is, if it's relatively right. rare. but Actually, uh, maybe what you do, maybe what's next is to try and figure out what the host and the vector are. Yeah, that's right. right. We don't know what the reservoir is, right? Because it ticks, yeah. it probably doesn't just replicate in ticks. It's probably coming from oh, another animal, right? Right. And they right. mention a bunch of hosts for this tick. Most mammals, you know, dogs, cattle, sheep, yak, donkeys, pigs, deer, 
cats, rat, et cetera, hedgehogs, yeah. weasels, and humans, along with some birds. So I guess they're out there trapping and checking for the virus in a bunch of these animals. Yeah, and in terms of a uh, vaccine, I suspect it's not going to make a lot of sense to go in that direction versus something like a vector control effort. Right, right. Yes, um, which which would have other benefits because this is certainly not the first tick-borne disease that's been discovered. Yeah. I suspect we'd like to know if it's outside of China too, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. See how extensive it is. So we'll, I'm sure we'll hear about this in the coming years. And, so uh, I would say that this is a, a, a success for the China mega project for infectious diseases. Yeah. Yeah. They have this virus and now they can go forward. And, right. And we're not yeah. saying that they're proving this causes this disease, but it's a good start. And right. as we said, you can go forward now and, and do what you need. Right. Now, and, it, and also, you know, they've got their, um, you know, their PCR primers and, and you know what antibodies you're looking for. And so other people can hopefully go and try and replicate this. Yep. Okay. That's cool. There you right. go. Yeah. Story one. Story two, I wanted to visit briefly the polio outbreak in the Congo, which we talked about back on TWIV 110, because uh, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report came out with a, uh, a report on this. It's not quite over yet. It's called Notes from the Field, Polio Outbreak, Republic of the Congo, September 2010 to February 2011. I have to say that I, uh, since I finished Inside the Outbreaks, which you sent me, yeah. when I read, read something that says notes from the field, it does something completely different to me. Yeah, because I, cool. I, I have some sense now of what that means. That's an incredible, an in- incredible work that uh, people do in the field. Have you read that, Alan? I have not. Can you send a copy to Alan, uh, Rich? Sure. I will do that. Because I'd like cool. to get the author on Twiv at some point. And I spilled coffee on it, Alan. You're going to have to deal with that. But uh, I'll, I'll be able to read through it. Yeah. Okay. As it long was, as it's not an e-book, because you spill coffee on those and they're done. <laughs> so there was an outbreak in the Republic of the Congo back in September 2010, type 1 polio virus. Uh, there were th- over 300 confirmed polio cases. It was an unusual outbreak because um, it was a high fatality rate, and the age was higher than normal uh, for this for polio. Searching for the mean age, twenty years of age, the mean age of patients twenty years compared to like seven and a half elsewhere in the Republic of the Congo. So what they have done is to get uh, the virus from some of these individuals and sequence them. Good for the article here. I have it right up here. Why don't I have it in front of me? Here we go. So there's a rapid communication from Eurosurveillance. Type 1 wild polio and putative enterovirus 109 in an outbreak of acute flaccid paralysis. And so the cool thing here is that they got polio type 1 from one sample uh, 100% identity at the amino acid level to an isolate from a strain in India, and also high similarity, excuse me, to a strain in from Angola, a 95% identity, and also very high identity with a strain from Tajikistan. So there's still endemic polio in India, and the idea is that this is spreading from India to Tajikistan and to Angola, and then to the Congo. So, you know, if you're not immunized, and one of the problems in this outbreak is that there's low immunization coverage, global travel will bring the virus everywhere. And I love um, the the CDC is great for understatements like this. Um, they've got this, this uh, explanation of the vaccination um, problem there. Vaccination coverage has been low over the last two decades, secondary to weaknesses in the delivery of health care and routine vaccination services, complicated by civil war and conflict during 1997 to 99. Other possible contributing factors are crowding of residents and severe limitations in water supply and sanitation. And I, I saw that. And, you know, if you if you look up Congo civil war on Wikipedia, you actually get to a, um, a disambiguation page. Right, because they've because there it. have been so many. Right, and so this is—I mean, this is a place that has been in chaos for much of its history, and and you know, this is why 
there's a problem with vaccination yeah, coverage. Yeah, that's a good. I'm glad you it, found that. That's in the morbidity mortality report. <laughs> it, it's a, it's a, ama- it's amazing that they can maintain any kind of vaccination status at all. Yeah, yeah, and, and that the you know you could you can have people going in and tracking this. You know, that's the kind of environment that they're working in to try and track down this uh, this epidemic. Yeah. So what's with this enterovirus 109? Okay, it came from one patient. And that's all. They didn't find it anywhere else. And this patient had no polio in him or her. It's a, okay. dece- a deceased patient from a rectal swab. So we don't know if this actually caused okay. the illness, but uh, it it could because it's an enterovirus. It could cause paralytic disease. It's one of the newer ones, 109. So we don't know a lot about it. And that's all I can tell you. We don't know why it was more virulent, why the age distribution is different. These are so if things. we get rid of polio, we aren't necessarily rid of enterovirus-induced paralytic disease. Is no, that that's, right? that's correct. Mm-hmm. And one of the things people have speculated about is whether those enteroviruses would move in to the niches vacated by polio. I, I, I doubt it because there's already many niches available, and we haven't seen an, you know, an explosion with those viruses. But if they are very low level, you might see them more once polio is gone, especially in these areas. So I don't know if you saw it, but in the same issue of MMWR, and I think the preceding article is uh, sort of a review <clears> that's <throat> called Progress Toward Interrupting Wild Poliovirus Circulation mm-hmm. in Countries with Reestablished Transmission, Africa 2009-2010. Right. And I found this, uh, there's a map, figure one, that shows the cases of uh, polio type one and two their distribution right um in um 2009 and 2010 and you know we're it's like it's really kind of we're like i feel like we're chasing our tail here you know it's very it's hard yeah chasing around from one area to another one country's clean one year and it's got a problem the next year and it kind of keeps going around right no that's the problem bill gates is up against when he says you know we're going to eradicate it and then people say don't waste your money because it's hard. You have to do really high immunization coverage. Otherwise, that's what happens. You get polio. It comes back. Got to stop the war. Yeah, that's a big yeah. problem, right? You're not going to do that. So this is all type 1 and type 3. Yeah, type 2 is not much left. In fact, the WHO has declared it officially eradicated. Although in Nigeria a year ago, there was an outbreak of vaccine-associated type 2. So wild type 2 seems to be gone. So uh, I noticed that uh, part of the vaccine strategy for some of these outbreaks was giving monovalent type 1 vaccine. Yeah, they decided right? to do that recently, right, in the last five uh, years or so. It's been and so new. are there a lot of uh, programs now that use, like, divalent that don't have type 2 in them since type yes. 2 has been de- – okay. Yeah, type 2 they're not using a lot. In fact, what happened in Nigeria, they, if you remember, they had stopped immunizing a number of years ago for a year – so wild polio came back. And then when they resumed immunization, they were using monovalent 1 and 3. And so they had an outbreak of type 2, vaccine-associated type 2. I see. Which spread from a neighboring country that was still using the trivalent OPV. Oh, what a problem. You see this? It's so complicated. Yeah. It's really tough. So I, I read a quote the other day saying, this will work because Bill Gates only backs winners. And so I'm thinking. <laughs> well, I also uh, remember a quote from they had this, the Gates Foundation had this meeting to look at five years later on a bunch of its uh, projects that were highly innovative projects. And one of the quotes was something on the order of, we were naive. Yeah. This is more difficult than we thought. Well, I, so, I, you know. I think that's a fair assessment. They certainly yeah. were. But they were so, they were so, uh, conf- um, what's the word? When Complacent? You, con, they were ho- confidential. No. Uh, confident? Complacent? Confi- they, they were very confidently naive. They said this will okay. work, you know. Right. And Alan well, I want- and I criticized it years ago. <laughs> yeah. I wonder. Yeah, as, for, as for Bill Gates backing winners, you, you just you ought to Google Microsoft Bob. Just a thought. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Not everything they've done has been Not everything they've done yeah. has been great. Uh, one, one last thing I wanted to note here they ha- there was no direct contact between all the cases. Okay, so it's not person-to-person spread. So they don't know what the source was. They say maybe a diffuse source like water, 
well, as we pointed out before, if you've got 400 uh, cases of polio, you've got, what, 40,000? Yeah, infections. Right, 40,000 yeah. or 400,000 infections. What's the, what's the uh, case rate? It's one in 100. One in 100, okay. So there could, there's a lot more out there than yep. just what shows up in the paralytic stuff. Yeah. So that's, that's an update. It's not done because they, they would like to figure out where this came from and how it spread. But it won't be the last, I'm sure, unfortunately. It's very hard to eradicate. It's pretty low now, globally, less than yeah. 2,000 cases. But yeah. those 2,000, yeah, 20,000 infections, right? And it's hard. It's hard. All right, so let's move on to our third story, which uh, it was also was this suggested by someone. Yes. It was, a, it was a reader email, right? I can't uh, remember. Or, or was it Michelle last week? And then she picked something else. Okay. I think it was a reader um, email. Anyway, it is called Biofilm-like Extracellular Viral Assemblies Mediate HTLV-1 Cell-to-Cell Transmission at Virological Synapses. So this is not a virus we have talked about, right? HTLV-1? Human right. T cell leukemia virus type one, and this is a retrovirus. One of the uh, four or five, I guess you would say, known human retroviruses. So there's HTLV one, two, and three, and HIV one and two. And actually, HTLV one was the first human retrovirus discovered before HIV, and it infects quite a few people fifty to fifteen to twenty million people, mostly asymptomatic. 5 to 10% of the infections lead to leukemia or these inflammatory syndromes with wonderful names like HTLV-1-associated myelopathy, tropical spastic paraparesis, HAM-TSP, and those are inflammatory syndromes. So the, this paper does a very cool thing looking at how viruses transferred from one cell to another. And we know for both HTLV and HIV that you need sometimes you need sometimes viruses are passed from cell to cell by very intimate contact. So we have this vision of virions budding from the cell surface and floating around and encountering a number of cells. And it that probably doesn't happen a lot for HTLV one. You probably need cell to cell contact. For HIV, there's something called the virological synapse. That's been shown to form. When you get infected with HIV, it's picked up by dendritic cells. And then those dendritic cells go into the uh, lymph node where they present the virus to lymphocytes. And the dendritic cell and the T cell form a synapse. And in that synapse, the virus is introduced into the lymphocyte. And in this paper, they are looking at this kind of synaptic transmission. And they say, actually, it doesn't form a synapse, but the infected T cells put vir new virions on their surface and they keep them in this structure on the surface which is carbohydrate rich and is, is made up of proteins of the extracellular matrix. Right. And uh, they liken it to a bacterial biofilm. Right. And so when then when they, these cells contact another cell, they present this this little packet of virions on the cell surface to the target cell, and then they infect them. They would take CD4 T cells from people with HTLV1 infection and, and analyze those. They have these wonderful pictures of clusters of viral proteins on the cell surface. And figure one is just staining for viral proteins. You can see them. They're little bundles of, of virions. I've never seen anything like that before. Right. right. And it, they co-localize with... Um these um, uh, intracellular matrix proteins. Right. Carbohydrates. Carbohydrates. Right. They actually right. use, this is an amazing table here, where they, uh, they, they stain these, I think it's in the supplementary data, they stain these cells with a variety of lectins, which are carbohydrate-binding proteins, just to figure out what particular sugars are there. And they can pretty much um, identify the precise sugars that are, anchoring these virions to the surface. So they can say, yeah, we have this sugar and that sugar, using these plant lectins. I think it's Im important that they have a bunch in the supplementary information that don't work. Mm -hmm. okay? 
So, so it looks like a specific effect. Yeah, in right. fact, for all of the lectins and also for the extracellular matrix proteins, mm-hmm. not every one is present. Right. Right. It's not just like, oh, whatever we use lights up these, yeah. the, the whole surface. Yeah. That would be suspicious. The other thing they found in these structures, I don't know what to call them. What do they call them? I think they give it a word of some sort. Packets of virions on the cell surface. They find tetherin. Right. Which is a interferon-induced transmembrane protein that, for many envelope viruses, seems to hold the virions on the cell surface, so they actually can't get away. It's, right. It has an antiviral effect. Now, HIV gets around that because it makes a protein called VPU that degrades tetherin. And HTLV, HTLV-1 doesn't make VPU, so it can't degrade tetherin. But it doesn't care because this is how it's delivering the viruses to a target cell. It uses tetherin in, in, along with everything else to hold it on the cell surface until a new cell comes along and then it delivers it. Yeah, I love that. It's using an antiviral protein as part of its delivery yeah. mechanism. Right. Isn't that great? It's- so one of the things they don't know is how the virions are released when these cells contact the target cell. And that's an interesting question. They have some nice pictures here of a virus-loaded cell contacting a target cell, and they actually mush up right against each other. Right. Yeah, but yeah the, the microscopy technique in this paper is just amazing. Yeah, this makes me very insecure, this, this microscopy. <laughs> <laughs> I just look at this stuff, and I, I just could never do any of this. <laughs> I like the scanning EMs. I've always liked scanning. They're beautiful. EMs. Oh, those are those are wonderful. Really yeah. nice images of the surface. Now it occurs to me. It occurred to me in reading this that these immunocytes, if you like, are part of their job is to contact other similar cells. Right. Right. That's right. what they do for a living. Yeah. To so snuggle up to other cells and communicate their status, and so it it makes sense that a virus would uh, would. Uh, be transmitted by that close cell-to-cell contact in a situation yeah, like that. it has evolved it to take. Lot, makes a lot more sense in some ways than uh, dissociating and being free in solution, probably because the cells like to uh, uh, recognize each other. It's probably a, a lot more efficient to be transported on the cell surface by contact rather than being released and, and wind up being diluted in the serum and go looking around for a cell. Right. Yeah, you, you don't have to find your next host. Right. <laughs> so they say here, in conclusion, our data do not support a model of contact-induced virus budding and transfer through synaptic clefts. So that's the virus synapse but rather the existence of preformed transient extracellular structures that adhere to the surface of target cells during cell contacts. Uh, They say also that the infected cells produce more of the stuff that's in this biofilm than do uninfected cells, Hmm. as if the virus is somehow influencing the synthesis of this stuff. There's a, uh, you know, you could say teleologically, deliberately, though it's not clear how that might happen. Yeah. And they also say that the biofilm might, in fact, uh, mask the virus from the immune system Mm -hmm. to some extent, so it may serve a dual role in that case. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And the last sentence, of course, as extracellular structures of a particular composition, viral biofilms might be potential targets for future antiviral therapy. There you go. Of course. It could be. Biofilms are hot in bacteria, right? Yes, big deal. A big deal. And when I was being learned, taught about bacteria in college, we didn't know what a biofilm was. It's one of those things that's brand new. It's amazing. Yep. Well, and they even they even found in this paper, you know, if you if you remove the ability to do this, the virus doesn't transmit as well between cells. So it's it seems Important. like it's a, yeah. it's mm-hmm. a potentially very good target. Yeah. So I think this is uh, going to be increasingly an area of interest, not just for this virus, but I suspect many others. Of course, the the, vac- the pox viruses we know go from cell to cell with interesting ways too, right, Rich? Right, right. We did that yeah. in TWIV 68, one of my all-time favorites. That's right, Ode to a Plaque, right? Right. Um, so there's, uh, we need to look into more of this. There must be more uh, spread papers out there. Yeah. Send them in, listeners. I wonder if it's a we'll function of... Um, viruses that infect 
T-cells, where, as you said, Rich, the T-cells have to snuggle up to other cells to do what right. they're meant to do. And other cells don't normally do that. Could but be, but the, the vaccinia, yeah. the, the pox ones, are not T-cells, so... No, no, the pox, uh, the pox infections, they're very um, promiscuous. And right. the, <clears throat> the cultured cells that were used for that were uh, just a regular fibroblast-type yep. cell. All right, let's move on to some email. First one is from David who is David up at Vassar, who we've heard one from before. I teach an intro biology course on viruses at Vassar College. We do our introductory biology a little bit differently. Each class has a theme through which we explore the fundamental principles of biology. Mine is on viruses and their hosts. It's a great way to explore everything in biology, cells, genetics, evolution, etc., and get students hooked on virology in their freshman year. We had a recent discussion in class on the evolutionary benefits of lysogeny, specifically relating to the temperate phage CTX5, which expresses the cholera toxin responsible for the severe diarrhea seen in cholera. We should probably explain what lysogeny is, right? Sure. Uh, So it's kind of like, um, well, the equivalent in mammalian cells is uh, the retroviruses. Yeah. So... The, uh, in this case, we're talking about double-stranded DNA-containing viruses. The classic is uh, phage lambda, <clears throat> called temperate phages, that infect a naive host, inject their DNA, uh, and they actually have a decision at that point whether they want to go through a lytic cycle or a lysogenic cycle. Lytic cycle means just the same old thing. They make virus proteins. Uh, replicate viral DNA, package it, lyse the cell, and get out. Uh, Lysogeny means that the viral DNA, a couple of uh, specific proteins get made that assist in this process, and the viral DNA gets integrated into the host uh, host chromosomal DNA as what is called a prophage. Once again, the bacterial equivalent of, in the eukaryotic world, a provirus in uh, retroviral terms. Mm. So the whole genome then can sit in the chromosome in a relatively quiescent state. Makes a couple of proteins that uh, keep it in a repressed state. Uh, The lambda repressor is, in the case of lambda, is what's used. Um, Keep it in a repressed state over, and the cells can divide and divide and divide. And then it may encounter, uh, encounter a circumstance where that repression is relieved and now induce a lytic cycle again. Of course, a nice difference between phages and retroviruses is that once the retroviral DNA is integrated, it's there for good. Correct. Mm -hmm. And in the case of the prophage, it's there until it's induced again to a lytic cycle. And once you go through lysis, of course, the cell's dead. Right. 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 So, David continues, the students wondered why not just stick with the lytic cycle when you can potentially infect so many more cells? What's the benefit of being able to make the switch? We had also discussed the balance of virulence and transmission, that viruses will evolve towards an appropriate level of virulence based on their mode of transmission, among other factors. So here is an explanation I came up with. You can think of the lytic cycle as highly virulent, 100% mortality, since infected cells will lyse and die, or lysogenic as non-virulent, no negative effect on the host while the phage is present as a prophage. So when would high virulence be favored for transmission? And when would low virulence be favored? A highly virulent pathogen runs the risk of wiping out its host population. If the cells are growing actively in an environment like the gut and the virus is replicating to high levels, it could spread to the entire host population, eventually killing every cell. Viral replication is much faster than cell division, and when cells divide, only two cells are made. But when viruses replicate, many virions are made. The virus would then depend on either more V. cholera entering the gut or getting out of the gut and spreading to a new human host infected with cholera. Alternatively, cholera can also grow in the environment, so the phage could infect the cell in the environment. However, there is some obvious risk there, that of finding the next host cholera cell either in a gut in a gut or the environment. It's a big world out there for a tiny phage and a tiny bacterial cell to meet each other. The less risky approach might be to limit virulence and allow prophage-infected cells to survive. The cholera cells will be returned to the environment where they can replicate or to a new human host where it can also replicate. Either way, the phage is guaranteed to find a host because it's already in it. 
Now, if the prophage finds itself in cells that are no longer growing, there may be an advantage to getting out and finding happy hosts. Cells that are not growing could be at a greater risk of cell damage and death. Perhaps they are not acquiring the nutrients and energy necessary to grow or repair cellular damage. If the cell dies, the phage will, be, will not be able to replicate, so the phage would enter the lytic cycle and release progeny. The risk of not finding a new host would presumably be lower than the risk of staying within a dying host. High virulence, therefore, is advantageous for transmission in this situation. What are your thoughts on this explanation? I'm sure there are other ideas, and I'd be interested in hearing them. I thought there was... I, I haven't followed this story in, in several years, but... Um, <clears throat> I know uh, Rita Caldwell um, was working on exactly this CTX5 and cholera, um, mm-hmm, right. and uh, I don't know if she's still. She kind of went into public policy and did quite well with that. Um, but I, I thought some of her work and some of the other work on that in the '90s had shown that there was some role for some CTX5 produced um, protein. In the ecology of, of Vibrio cholerae in the um, in the environment, like when it's not in humans, because um, it has a free living life cycle. It's out there in um, in estuaries and and in other you know out on the ocean, um, and I think it's normally just living among the plankton and doing its thing. And I, th- I somehow I thought that there was something going on with. Um, with this phage giving maybe a selective advantage in that environment. And as I say, I haven't followed it recently. Maybe that didn't pan out. But um, it's possible that the uh, the host may actually benefit in that context, too. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, th- this is something that we uh, uh, didn't point out explicitly in talking about uh, lysis versus lysogeny. And that is that in this whole process, the bacteriophage can pick up host genes and transfer them to uh, to other hosts, so it's a way of uh, horizontally transmitting genes as well. So the 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 phage can wind up carrying genes that are advantageous to the host, so that when it lysogenizes, the uh, the host has an advantage. Right. So that makes the that makes the sort of selection pretty complicated. So I asked Max Gottesman, our resident phage expert here who uh, was on TWIV a while ago and talked about phages. I said, why don't all phage lysogenize? He said, from the phage's point of view, being a prophage protects against drying and other insults in the environment. So there you go. If if you're in the host, you don't have to worry, yet you can still be passed on to new bacteria. So you're fulfilling the transmission as a prophage, mm-hmm. but... Uh, and for the host, phage carry useful genes, toxics, toxins, protective cell wall components, etc. So but at you, the same time, you're not making a whole lot of virus when you're a prophage. Right. The occasional bit of lysis helps you really get around. Yeah, it does. And go to other bacteria and carry your genes with you. So going in and out transfers genes also, right? So there's a selection for that at some level. A phage that can pop out and pull a gene with it may have an advantage. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. That's what we think. There's a balance between the two. To, the, to me, that's that's what it is. It's yeah. a balance between the two, and you can you can cite advantages and disadvantages to being either, as as David already has. Uh, David covered a lot of it in his uh, in his letter. It's interesting yeah. that um, eukaryotic viruses in general don't do this, though, right? Right. It's a real difference, and I wonder why that is. Hmm. I have to think about that one. You know, you don't have situations where you can switch between lytic and non-lytic states. With the retros, they go in and they're there. Well, in multicellular eukaryotes, um, you don't have the cells in a free-living form moving around in the environment, right? Yeah. So For the most part, right. So it's it's more to your advantage as a virus to get in, get out, infect a new host. There are, you, there are small... You, Multicellular eukaryotes, though, right? Yeah, and they're uh, yeah, and they're also unicellular. They're single ce- yeah, they're unicellular um, eukaryotes as well. But I don't know. Um, yeah, we don't know about. I'm sure there are viruses, but I don't know about how they work. Yeah. Well, um, Mimi virus infects an amoeba, right? Uh, that's right. That's unicellular, right? And cafeteria virus infects yeah. uh, whatever that was. Cafeteria yeah. rembergensis. Right. 
So, uh, yeah, and there we don't see this kind of behavior. Those are. And as a matter of fact, just this week, I spent a whole lot of time with Jim Van Etten at University of Nebraska. He works on a fascinating virus called chlorella virus mm -hmm. that affects a blue-green algae. Okay? Very interesting stuff. Cool things going on with those viruses. <laughs> we'll talk about another time. All right, the next one's from Rao, who sent us a link to a story from CNN. Mass deaths of birds in two states. This was back in January. Thousands of 5,000 birds falling from the sky after New Year's Eve. He says, um, <laughs> is this due to a virus, bird flu? So I looked it up, and um, it's not bird flu, likely, anyway. It's just uh, that, well, I found an article from, on NPR which says it's due to trauma. Yeah. Uh, loud noises flushing the birds from their roost and dying, crashing into things and dying. So, New Year's Eve, yeah, right? Exactly. You got a bunch of fireworks going on, stir up the birds, they go flying around, they're not used to flying around at night, and they run into buildings and windows and stuff. Right. What yep. a tragedy. What a drag. It's too bad, but it's not a virus. Okay, uh, Jacob writes, um, he sends us a link to an article in the British Medical Journal, which we've talked about before. I just thought we would acknowledge him sending it, the story behind how the MMR vaccine autism paper was forged. This is, of course, the um, Brian Deere expose. Right. He's linked to it. And uh, so thanks for that, Jacob. A tour de force of investigative journalism. Very nice. Yes, if you haven't read it, you should. Uh, the next is from Jacob. No, that was from Jacob. Sorry. Next is from Kathy, our friend in Michigan. Hi, guys. I saw this and immediately had to take a picture. Another way of thinking about the cold chain. Wonderful picture of a cold chain. Yes, a very cold chain. Yes, right. a chain encased in ice. A cold chain, of course, you have to maintain to keep things cold when they're going to degrade otherwise. Thanks for the recent mention, which when Rich used my suggestion for weekly science pick... The story about the grade school children's research about bee behavior. I've now had my 15 seconds of fame. I thought you were supposed to get 15 minutes. I thought that was Warhol's thing. You're supposed to yeah. get 15 minutes. So she's got time coming to her. Yeah. Well, this is here you go again, Kathy. Yeah. And you got another letter coming up, too. Next one is from Jim, who sends us a couple of references, one from Slash Dot. Frederick Seller writes, Seiler writes, when David Harriman, this book's author, was studying physics at Berkeley, he noticed an interesting contrast. In my physics course, I learned how to determine the atomic structure of crystals by means of X-ray diffraction and how to identify subatomic particles by analyzing bubble chamber photographs. In my philosophy of science course, on the other hand, I was taught by a world-renowned professor that there is no such thing as scientific method and that physicists have no better claim to knowledge than voodoo priests. I knew little about epistemology, the philosophy of knowledge at the time, but I could not help noticing that it was the physicists, not the voodoo priests, who had made possible the life-promoting technology we enjoy today. Harriman noticed the enormous gulf between science as it is successfully practiced and science as it is described by post-Kantian philosophers such as Feyerabend, who are totally unable to explain the spectacular achievements of modern science. And all that makes me think we'd be better off telling students they need to research anything they wish— but they have to apply certain rules as they do it. Isn't that what's done for graduate work in England that doesn't require all the American testing but uses mentor evaluations and a final oral exam? Right. Then, although I initially thought about traditional courses and what kind of word problems, I then ran across another article. All secondary school students should be required to be trained in CPR and receive an overview of automated external defibrillators according to an American Heart Association science advisory. And that reminded me that while we have loads of word problems, I don't know if we are yet including examples that deal with daily situations, CPR-like, concerned with balancing checkbooks, student loan size versus projected salary size, income tax preparation, or buying that car Vince mentioned at different purchase rates. No solutions, just meandering thoughts. Yeah, so uh, uh, he's talking about practicality in uh, public education, yep. and that ought to include um, the ability to uh, evaluate claims of science in the media. And science is a practical skill. Yes, right. And, and it is our birthright. Right. People have been practicing science for thousands of years, 
and we benefit from that that knowledge that's been accumulated this way. Um, and to to not teach kids how to do science is a is a tremendous disservice. I have an article here by uh, well from our Columbia newspaper on an interview with Brian Green. Either of you know who that is? Yeah, no. the guy who founded string theory. I guess. Uh, right. right. I don't know if he founded it, Alan. He, he's done he's a, a he's a big proponent of it. Certainly, I read one of his books. Um, the elegant universe. Was the elegant universe or the hidden reality? Uh, he has a whole bunch of them. Oh, he has more. Uh, okay. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, may have been the elegant universe. Anyway, great, great um, he has a quote here which I think is relevant. So, um, in the broader public, there is significant resistance to engaging with science. This is largely due to the way that many have encountered science in the classroom, where there's focus tendency to focus on details, without an equal focus on the big, wondrous scientific ideas. We need to make clear that science is not something you can willfully ignore. All of the major decisions going forward, from stem cells to nuclear proliferation to nanotechnology, have a scientific component. How can you be part of a democracy if you can't participate in the discussion about these ideas? Well, I think the problem is you can participate in the discussion whether you understand it or not. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, so you, that you're that right. is a problem, yes. It is. All right, the next is from Kathy again, our friend in Michigan. Hi, guys. I think it was on number 115 where Vincent made a comment about defensins and viruses. Yeah. So I said there haven't been many defensins shown to work in virology, and of course I was wrong. There have been there has been some work on that, at least in adenoviruses. A new assistant professor, Jason Smith at UW in Seattle, is continuing work. He began as a postdoc with Glenn Nemero. Uh, she sent a screenshot of a PubMed search. <laughs> to show his papers. Mm -hmm. uh, she says, I half expected Alan to do the search during the show. Sorry. <laughs> There's, uh, I enjoyed the discussion about the paper on colored pseudorabies virus from Lynn Enquist's lab. Now I'll have to read it, then listen again with the paper in hand and maybe read it several more times from what Rich says. I listened to your influences in science while shoveling my driveway. Jealous, Rich? No. <laughs> <laughs> I did my time. One of my influences in science beyond my parents, chemists, and teachers, advisors, mentors was reading at a young age my father's copy of a translation of the biography of Marie Curie written by her daughter Eve in 1937. Mm, that would be an interesting book. Yeah. Have you guys read that? No. No. Mm. That would be cool. Uh, Jason Smith I met when I visited UW uh, last month or two months ago. And he mentioned that I had got it wrong about defensins and viruses, too. So there you go. I'm corrected. And At least should, he wasn't defensive about it. He wasn't defensive. I'm going to have him on TWIV. He said he would do it to talk about defensins. They're little Good. molecules that inhibit adenoviruses. So we Good. should do that. The next one is from Sarah. Hi, gentlemen. Any gentlemen out there? Not here. I'll I, let you know if I see any. I discovered the podcast relatively recently and really enjoy your work. I did my undergrad in microbiology and some grad school in public health. And after working for several years as a technician slash analyst doing molecular biology and other techniques in academic labs and a vaccine biotech, I just started nursing school. My goal is not to leave the mentality or love of basic science research behind, and to that end, I recently attended a seminar on campus by Paul Gopfert of U Alabama, Birmingham, with the title Cryptic Epitopes, Implications for M HIV Vaccine Design. The closest related paper I could find of his with a brief search was published on 18th January 2010 in JX Med. I'm not an HIV expert by any means, but I'm fascinated by the challenges this virus poses in practice, namely vaccine development and mutations that lead to multiple drug resistance. Never mind all the ways human behavior can affect the trajectory of HIV infection, e.g. adherence to ART. In this talk, Gopfert honed in a, on a realization that some HIV vaccines being tested in the field attempt to raise an immune response to epitopes whose sequences have been codon-optimized for optimal expression in humans. This is in contrast to other clinical studies using non-codon-optimized sequences derived from known field isolates of HIV. The problem with this codon optimization strategy is that the population of immunogenic epitopes from all the other reading frames, two forward and three reverse, is completely different than what the wild-type epitope population would look like. 
if I understand the consensus right, this would mean that even if the vaccine material is expressed well in the patient, the immune response would be largely irrelevant and unprotective. Hmm. Is it that just is, that is assuming that these other reading frames are really relevant? Do yeah. we know that? No, I don't know of any evidence that they are relevant. Okay. I mean, we know there's an envelope and a gag protein, right? And mm -hmm. you make antibodies against those. I don't know about these cryptic epitopes. No, neither From do the I. University of Alabama at Birmingham. She goes on to say, is it just me or does the use of codon opt optimization of an HIV antigen sequence for vaccine use seem like a big duh, bad idea in hindsight because of this issue of the alternative reading frame antigens? These are two different things we're, we're talking about here. Codon optimization is different from reading frames. Well, I think the idea here is that, now I haven't looked at this paper, but I think the idea here is that there are uh, hidden reading frames, maybe in the antisense direction or in different reading frames within yeah. the genes that are ordinarily thought to be the major immunodominant epitopes, the things that you would Im immunize against. And so if you go codon optimize, uh, you screw up the coding sequence for those otherwise cryptic open reading frames. And so they wouldn't be expressed properly. I see. Well, um, this, this study, they look in patients and they find evidence that some of these cryptic open reading frames are in fact uh, pr produced in people and they mutate during infection, suggesting there is some immune pressure on them. Hmm. But we don't know okay. what... He says we don't know what these proteins do. Right. So... Or if they have a role in yeah. uh, immunity. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, with, in the absence of knowing that these proteins have any function, that it's hard to say whether it, it was not a good idea to code on optimize or not. We do, have a, we do have a great tendency. I was just dealing with a problem. Well, uh, not a problem, a phenomenon today. We have a tendency to look at sequences and focus in on the things that we think are the open reading frames and sort of ignore things that might be embedded or antisense in there and say, well, that can't be real, you know. It yeah, can't we be. do. Uh, and, and, and so it does make sense to have a look at these things. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I agree that we tend to um, poo-poo certain things that are off the radar. But well, it all goes into the same thing that we've talked about before in the scientific method. Yeah. There's a natural tendency to focus in on something when you think you have the answer. All right? And the, right. the real challenge <clears throat> in doing science is to be able to um, look at that and say, well, maybe that's not the answer. Maybe it's something else. To change yeah. your mind. Be wrong. Yeah. Well, I'm looking here. I don't see... Maybe it's not the bunya virus making those people sick in China. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, until until you've nailed it all down, you don't actually. So so yeah, these could be. Um, I mean, there's there's certainly a lot of work going on with these. I just did a quick <clears throat> quick PubMed search on uh, HIV cryptic epitope, and mm -hmm. um, it you know it's not a it's uh, I get forty hits, um, and that's not necessarily the best search to do either, but. Well, the, he, this article concludes, these findings indicate that the HIV genome might encode and deploy a large potential repertoire of unconventional epitopes to enhance vaccine-induced in immunity. If it's true, uh, this group is certainly working on it, we'll know at sure. some point. You know, vaccine approaches are not, are not really taking this into consideration. Right. And, right. On, uh, the, on the other hand, you know, there's, a lot we don't, uh, there's obviously a lot we don't know about sure. developing an HIV vaccine, which is... Yeah big part of the problem. I'm aware of vaccine development programs for other viruses, HSV, that also use codon optimization in the antigen sequence. And we should probably say that you codon optimize so that you get good expression right. in certain systems. And different codons are used in, in bacteria versus humans, for example. With this issue of raising an immune response to antigens expressed from codon, optimized sequences cause a similar problem with other vaccine programs. Do all viruses or just retroviruses produce these black box proteins from alternative reading frames? Could the changes resulting from codon optimization also be affecting the effective immunogenicity of vaccines being tested for viruses other than HIV? What are the implications of these unconventional alternative reading frame epitopes in vaccine development? Is this phenomenon studied very often in terms of trying to understand what the ARF proteins made by viruses do in the first place? 
This may not be a TWIV appropriate discussion, but I thought it was a riveting real world issue at the junction of the wily behavior of a virus, what that means for individual patients' disease processes, and the expenditures of vast amounts of resources on clinical trials. Thanks very much for such an accessible, enjoyable, and educational podcast. It only would occur it would be a problem for those vaccines that are based on recombinant DNA, right? Right. Well, um, and specifically for those vaccines where, um, where you don't know what the protective antibody should be reacting to, right? Or if protect, if, what the protective response should be reacting to, right? If right. You, if you're trying to make a if you're trying to make a vaccine and you're having trouble, okay, because you can't really determine what the uh, immunizing epitope is or whatever, then maybe you ought to look and see uh, if there are other open reading frames, other potential proteins uh, that could be immunogenic that you've overlooked. Right. But there's a lot of cases where we know what the immunodominant epitopes are, and we, and we know that you can make a vaccine that is effective based on those. And in that case, uh, it becomes a moot point. Right. And the other thing is, if you don't codon optimize, you don't get good expression, so it may not matter what antigens you're expressing. So there, there really are a couple of issues here. So if you make an inactivated virus vaccine, this is not an issue, right? You grow right. the virus in cells and you inactivate it. So m many of our vaccines are like that. An attenuated infectious vaccine, is the same thing. There's no issue. Right. It's only when you are expressing a protein and then immunizing. So the H, some of the H, the HPV vaccines are virus, virus-like particles made in insect cells, and in yeast, right? Right. I don't know if they code on optimized to do that, but those I work. I would imagine very, that they are actually. Those work very well. Mm -hmm. and right. Have, they're protective, so we know what the the antigen is there, so that's not an issue. HIV is really the main one because people are still trying to struggle about what is a protective antigen, and they're not getting it. Right, and the uh, and the vaccines typically, I mean, the the in the Thai trial and other trials that I've seen are typically you're expressing uh, the protein from some sort of a vector, uh, either a DNA vector or a, a pox virus base base right. vector or something right. like that. So in that case, you codon optimize, and that basically wipes out all of these ARFs yeah. and. Uh, uh, stick them in a vector and express them in the uh, immunized individual. Yeah, I mean, who knows? Maybe that that's why they're not working in part. I mean, we really should get someone on who knows about this if, to, to answer it because I don't know. And I think the HIV would be the main one where this would be an right. issue. We have Kathy Collins coming on in a couple of weeks. Maybe she could address yeah, it. Yeah, let's remember sure. to talk to her about that. Okay, next one, name withheld, right. So I'm interested in understanding the means by which XMRV or MLV is, quote, transmitted, unquote. Is it transmitted by way of vaccination development and becomes operative when a person's immune system is suppressed for whatever reason? As yet, I've not seen any article which addresses this issue. Please note, I am an interested private individual. I am not associated with any particular organization, etc., that would be about step five in a process where we're still stuck at step zero. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know how it would be transmitted. We're still trying yeah. to figure out if it's in people, right? Right. Yeah, we, don't know, even... we don't know if it's transmitted. Exactly. We don't know if it's involved in anything, and we're still trying to work that out. So the question of how it's transmitted is much further down the line. Right. Okay, Charles sent us the Lady Gaga parody that Rich had picked on TWIV 118, so I just <laughs> wanted to thank Charles. Hi, TWIV team. I thought you might find this video entertaining. If you have not already seen it, I'm sure some of your followers might enjoy it also. Yes. Okay. I see that popping up all over the place. It's going to last for a while. Yeah. I haven't looked recently to see how many hits it's got. Yeah, last I saw was over a million. That was when you picked it, basically. 2,620,301. Yeah. It's, it's great. Really good. And we're approaching our mil millionth download. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> That's over two years. The next one's from Neil. I think in the past I've heard you read emails with picks of the weeks. If so, please consider the following book, Denialism by Michael Spector. Have you read it? There is also a short TED Talk, which touches on the main themes, but is too short to convey everything in the book. And he touches on a lot of the recurring issues that you do in the podcast, including the need for more scientific literacy in the general public, the vaccine slash autism debacle, the poor flu vaccine uptake rates, etc. 
Two of my favorite recent quotes have come from Mr. Spector. One from the TED Talk, We leap into the arms of big placebo, and from the last chapter of the book, experts chosen to represent a specific point of view are cheerleaders, not scientists, and people who rely on them are denialists. I highly recommend it. Okay. We'll I looked at out. this. Uh, I looked at this video. It's uh, it's pretty good. He's very, he's very animated and uh, uh, quite articulate on this uh, subject. Yeah, Specter. Specter is a very bright guy. Someone else has recommended this book, Denialism. I think it was another uh, reader or listener. On a, uh, it's a good book about why people deny things. Basically, the psychology right. of it and so forth. All right. Thanks, Neil. I'll check it out. John writes, Dear Doctors, first some context. My status as a science fan, layperson, goes hand in hand with my passion for skepticism. In that regard, Carl Sagan would be my intellectual hero in both fields. So I thought about writing in to give some general comments on the episode partway through. I wanted to express my general disappointment in science communication these days and simultaneously praise efforts like yours to communicate science. When you were talking about what we can, what can we scientists do to better inform people, decisions based on science versus emotion, I was thinking, well, you're already doing it. As a skeptic, we encounter this problem on a regular basis. The situation that your guest, Mr. Mnookin, was describing, Seth Mnookin, is a regular occurrence in all areas of woo and pseudoscience. What's woo? It's a, it's another term for pseudoscience, woo-woo, um, right. yeah, belief okay. in, in wacky Got stuff. It. This often arises from the use of a token skeptic. A perfect example of how the media gets its, it wrong is the recent astrology news. I watched CNN report that the Zodiac was changing and therefore your horoscopes might be wrong, then juxtaposed it with some random astrologers saying, don't worry, we know about it already. They all miss the real story, which is why does such a large proportion of the population of an industrialized country believe in magic? So I would like to add on my own toned-down reaction, which is we need scientists, both great and small, to become public intellectuals in their spare time. The more they discuss the merits of recent research in their fields, the better lay people are able to understand and be critically skeptical of new stories. Sadly, I do not have the patience of wiser men and women, and so when I hear about things like Jenny McCarthy versus 100,000 Doctors, it makes me quite angry, which leads to my next general comment. I can't believe one of your listeners could be that, <clears throat> could be so willfully ignorant as to be deifying the likes of Andrew Wakefield. I understand your show is an educational show about science and rightly eschews emotional reactions and political commentary. Your comment that the fellow's emails did not reflect that was perhaps the most diplomatic thing I've heard in a long time. I wish that we as a nation could critically look at the evidence, conclude that this person was a repugnant, morally bankrupt fraud willing to put the lives of children in danger to make a quick buck, exile him to the Arctic Circle, and move on with our collective lives. Once again, my background as a skeptic makes me intimately familiar with the arguments used by the anti-vaccine crowd. Whether via cum hoc ergo propter hoc fallacies <laughs> or their ability to move goalposts faster than the Army Corps of Engineers, they spread ignorance and paranoia like the plague. Sadly, their follow-the-money arguments do not trigger any ironic neurons in their brains and prompt them to check on the monetary incentives that Wakefield had. Ranting aside, this all goes to the overarching theme of the episode in my eyes, which is the failure of the scientific community to effectively communicate to the public. I am perhaps framing the problem unfairly and should add, and the failure of insert here to produce a nation of critical thinkers. One of the reasons that I like your show and similar groups of scientists discussing science is that I get to hear respectful, critical thinking in action. I know it's not virology, but part of the show is the communication of science and its role in the public. You aren't keeping Alan Dove around just for his jokes, are you? Certainly not. I hope not. So given the Wakefield devil, perhaps it would be useful to discuss science in the public discourse, what young scientists can do, what, what science fans can do, kindly urge us to be patient or spur us to action. So thanks for being my psychiatrist today, in addition to my virologist and parasitologist while I rant. Best regards, fan of the show, keep up the good work, lame joke about Alan, shake fist at Rich while it's minus two degrees out, and looking forward to more. Sincerely, John. <laughs> I've been waiting to read this for a while. I think it's... Really yeah, I would say thank you very much, John, for ranting. Thank you. Uh, yes. Right. Because 
you know, we are, uh, we kind of keep it toned down. Yeah, we should. So he rant. can yeah. he can rant he can rant for us. Right. Yeah. All right, that'll do it for our email, and let's do some picks of the week. Rich, what do you have for us? I came up with this right before the show once again because I went to my mailbox and I pulled out the uh, most recent issue of Emerging Infectious Diseases, which is a uh, CDC publication um, that is fairly widely distributed, and it has an article in it under the heading of Policy Review titled, Should Remaining uh, Stockpiles of Smallpox Virus Variola Be Destroyed? So this is something we've talked about very recently, and we uh, actually highlighted an article uh, in the journal Vaccine where the author uh, urged destruction of the small, the authors, it was an editorial, urged destruction of the smallpox stocks, and this is one that takes the opposite uh, position, so I thought it was interesting. The author is uh, Raymond Weinstein from Georgetown University School of Medicine, and in fact, uh, he's in the biodefense program, Department of Public and International Affairs at, uh, Affairs at George Mason University. So uh, he's an individual apparently with some, actually they've got a bio down here on him. He's a clinical associate professor of medicine at Georgetown University School of Medicine and a research professor at George Mason University. His research focuses on infectious diseases and biodefense. So he has uh, apparently, by CV anyway, some insight into this problem. And he advocates not um, destroying the vaccine. Uh, there were a couple of bits in this that I thought were interesting because uh, both Grant and I said that there were multiple uh, strains that we're talking about, and he specifically says that the U.S. collection consists of 450 isolates of variola, while various authoritative sources place the number of specimens retained by Russia at about 150 samples consisting of 120 different mm -hmm. strains. So that's a verification of the notion that we're talking about lots of different viruses, not just one virus. And he kind of reviews the history and he concludes first that the only real benefit of destroying all the known remaining stockpiles would uh, be the elimination of the extremely unlikely possibility of unleashing a lethal epidemic due to theft or accidental release of the virus from one of the remaining official stocks. And then he goes through um, uh, the usual liturgy of reasons why it should be kept around for future experimentation and says, don't get rid of it. So I thought that was an, additional, uh, an interesting addition to our uh, sort of ongoing uh, discussion of whether the smallpox virus mm. ought to be destroyed. Yeah, it's good. I'm glad to see that number of 450 isolates. Yeah, wow. Right. Yeah, and I was, you know, for a while, um, I was kind of leaning toward, yeah, we should get rid of it. And and now, you know, that I know more about these stocks and especially the biodiversity within them, I I think we ought to hang on to it. Well, one of the one of the things that I keep coming down to is that if you get rid of it, well. If you get rid of it, you can't get it. You can't have it back. Now, they yeah. Say, yeah, you can make it synthetically, but not the same. Not the same. These are these are a historical archive of uh, one of the worst diseases in human history, and you throw that away, and it's gone. Also, we don't we don't know the sequences of most of these isolates, right? So you right. can't even make them. I all, think there's so. sequences of about ninety. So yeah, yeah, we don't know the sequences of all of them. You and know, he makes he makes an argument here that the virus actually. Uh, applied a lot of selective pressure on humans. And he talks about the CCR5 allele right. uh, in the European population that is, at least by some, attributed to be uh, selection by resistance to smallpox. Um, and so he says there's a, there's a lot of the whole story of the virus's influence on even human evolution and the evolution of our immune system that we don't understand that we may be able to access with these strains. So. You know, one thing I was thinking of is that let's say the recommendation is to destroy and the U.S. and Russia say, OK, I don't think they would actually do it. Well, that's the that's where it gets really political. And so I yeah. say I bet they would say to the public they're they're gone and then they save some and then they <laughs> then they have to hide it forever, which makes it even harder uh, to keep it secure, right? That would make it a lot more dangerous. So yeah. that's, yes, that's my thinking. It's more dangerous because I don't think they would do it and they would 
do it covertly. So you might yeah, as well bad things it. bad things happen in politics out of the sunlight. Right. Yeah, it's better to have everything in the sunshine. That's an yeah. interesting interesting idea. Alan, what do you have? Well, my pick um, is something that uh, was put online a little while ago, but uh, I'm just getting around to picking it now. <laughs> the um, uh, I guess it's Oklahoma University or University of Oklahoma um, has a uh, a very interesting rare book collection, and one of the things they have is an original edition of the Zoology of the Beagle, and this was. Uh, Darwin's um, when it, when he got back from the voyage on the Beagle, he had this whole big collection of specimens that he'd picked up on this uh, what was supposed to be a Royal Navy surveying voyage, but he turned it into a productive research venture. Um, and he commissioned a bunch of zoologists and artists to um, to illustrate and describe the collection. And the illustrations are stunning. They're just these these amazing Victorian um, drawings and paintings, and uh, and it's not just a few plates. This thing is it's a five volume set that goes on for many many pages, and it's is organized taxonomically. Um, and so now it's this trove of all these images. They just scanned this thing. Uh, the whole thing some, online. The whole thing is online, and I just I linked to the front description of it and now um uh, i see down at the bottom there's links to individual yeah. pages holy cow yeah amazing so you go to the and now they're not ebooks that you're you can't just push a button and download them to your to your ipod um although if you want to read these uh or refer to them the text is already online um i think um uh whatchamacallit gutenberg already has the the, the text wow so that's searchable, but this is mainly <laughs> this is mainly for the images. So each page is scanned. They're, they're like eighteen megabyte tiffs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's <laughs> and that's the point is that these are um, huge, high resolution files nice. that you can download the original artwork for. And if you want to, um, you know, obviously the copyright on this thing expired a very, very long time sure, ago. Sure. Um, I think you should probably acknowledge uh university of oklahoma if you're using any of these scans but um but the images are just wow. really really cool nice. there's some very cool pictures of bats bats that's what yes. i'm looking at yeah. yeah nice and excellent some rodents cool this is beautiful really nice good job chuck yeah <laughs> nice. chuck strikes again great well my pick is a book that just came out by paul offit Paul Alfred is well known. He's a chief of infectious diseases at the University of Pennsylvania Children's Hospital. He's written a bunch of books. We've talked about his biography of Maurice Hilleman, and uh, he's written a bunch of other books, The Cutter Incident. And this one is simply Vaccines in Your Child, Separating Fact from Fiction. It's written with Charlotte Moser. It's like a handbook for parents about vaccines. It gives you all the information you want to know about all the vaccines that are out there. Um, and what's in them and how they work and all about the pathogens themselves. Pretty straightforward self uh, That's stuff. That's good. This que is great. There is a, there is a uh, chapter full of questions. What are vaccines? Why do we need them? How do they work? And then safety, ingredients, practical considerations. Can I vaccinate my child if I'm breastfeeding? And then individual vaccines. Vaccines in the first year of life, second year of life, adolescents and teens. The vaccine schedule, really good stuff. Good info. That's that's excellent. That's I'm glad he did that. That's excellent. Yeah. Well, I give my child the chickenpox vaccine, stuff like that. So it's really pretty straightforward, easy to read, and good information to make to make you understand what you should be doing there. So and cheap. Pretty cheap. What is it? Uh, Eleven bucks. Eleven bucks. Yep. Buy it. So Buy check Amazon. it out if you're if you have any questions about vaccines. I think it's really worthwhile to check that out good and that will do it for twiv number 127 recorded on april fool's day don't forget to check out our facebook page facebook.com slash this week in virology you can listen to us at twiv.tv on itunes the zoom marketplace or at microbeworld.org slash twiv and we also have an app that you can use to stream the episodes to your iphone ipad 
or Android device. You can find that at microbeworld.org slash app. If you like Twiv, leave a comment over at iTunes. It helps us stay on the front page of the medicine podcast section. And of course, send us your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv. Well, Dixon never showed up. No, I was just thinking that. Yeah, I can hear him still talking next door, so wow, I, I don't have to thank him. <laughs> Alan Dove is at alandove.com. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure to hear your lame jokes, as John would say. Yes. <laughs> lame joke about you, actually, not by you. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida. Thank you, Rich. You're quite welcome. You know what I'm going to do now? What are you I'm going to go infect some cells. Yeah, awesome. What kind of viruses are you using? Uh, it's just regular old vaccinia. We're going to try and uh, try and uh, we got a collaboration with a with a guy. We're going to try and label the fats and see if we can see them with this new technology. Mm, have fun. So, Sounds yep. good. Well, cool. I, I split my HeLa cells today. That's my last. All one. right. And I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>